more people will file in this. Probably start with the introduction. Hello and welcome to our last uh, Nano EP seminar of the year. Um, today actually is not only a Nano EP uh, seminar, it's also an EBS, uh, EBS Distinguished Lecture. Um, our speaker today is Professor Kim A. Lau from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. It's a beautiful location. Um, she got her PhD degree from electrical engineering at the at uh, Rice University. Um, she is an IEEE fellow and NSF faculty award for women's scientists and engineers, uh, which is a senior research fellowship. And uh, her specialty is in uh, epitaxial growth, and she will be. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Can we have uh, this yeah. front row of light off? Not the whole room. Okay. I don't want to encourage napping. <laughs> okay, so this is our campus. It's the Hong Kong University of Science Technology. Um, so for those of you who uh, never come visit us, uh, I invite you to come visit. This is uh, like a resort. And uh, some of you who came, and uh, they can uh, tell you more about it. I can uh, show you where we are. So this is a map of Hong Kong. So uh, this is the airport, and this is the Hong Kong Island that you see most of the pictures from. And we are here at this uh, East <coughs> Bay, as uh, facing um, the Pacific Ocean. Of course, there are some islands in between. And this is uh, our campus on the east side. Uh, we are about half an hour car ride. Hong Kong is really tiny, or train ride. And then this is China. This is the border between Hong Kong and China. Um, so it's a very convenient place that you can get to. And now already, this is the picture of our campus that I took. <laughs> and this is our library. And this is, uh, you look out from, um, from our window, either your dorm or our housing, or um, not classrooms. Classrooms, there's no windows. <laughs> and not lab, not clean room. Clean room has no windows. <laughs> but, uh, um, but you can, uh, this is the view from your dorm room, and this is uh, from our um, faculty dorm. And since we are facing east, you have your jet lag, and the uh, you cannot sleep like uh, six o'clock uh, in the morning, then you see the sunrise. And this is also our campus, uh, our campus building. And this is uh, one of these windows, my office. So these are, are a couple of our friends. You recognize who they are? <laughs> this is Jim, can visit us a few years ago. I'm not going to tell you what he's holding, you ask him. And this is uh, something interesting. And uh, Professor Milton Fan. Uh, well, this is not our university, but uh, we work together on the HBTs. So, okay, this is the online of my talk. Uh, first of all, I'm going to like, give some the students uh, some little tutorial of a lattice match and lattice mismatch of semiconductors and the motivation of uh, we are doing metamorphic growth. Uh, no. All the growth we do are for device applications. Uh, we are not, the emphasis are not in uh, like the growth mechanisms and so on. And everything we grow is uh, for devices. How and uh, everything we optimize, we uh, try to correlate is the device performance. And we do all this by MOCVD. And then we do a lot of material characterization uh, before we fabricate the devices. And then we'll, I'll have some device results to show you and the summaries. Okay, so this is a, a table of the, the common, commonly used the semiconductors. Of course, silicon, and there's a gamma arsenide base 35, indium phosphide base 35, um, silicon carbide, the Y gap, and then the, the gamma nitride. Uh, we work with. Um, all this here except the silicon carbide is uh, too expensive and uh, I cannot afford them. 
So, and, uh, and I've been working with uh, um, this uh, gamma sign indium phosphide base 3.5 for many years, and, uh, and then for the past um, uh, 15 years or so, and on gallium nitride. And you can see this uh, properties, uh, all of them, they have their own individual uh, properties, uh, what they're good for, what they're not too good for. And uh, you can see that indium phosphide, probably the one that would um, that give you the best uh, mobility and its alloys that give you the best transistors. And then the, for the wide gap, for the power, you want to go for the nitride if you don't want to pay the money for silicon carbide. And then for silicon, of course, it is the workhorse of um, semiconductors, the ICs and everything. So. Um, the theme of uh, our current research now, everything going on in our group, is uh, how do we integrate all this um, goody goody three fives on silicon. And so this is uh, all the projects that we are doing. Uh, we do it by direct growth. That's what uh, my seminars focus on. We also do a uh, wafer bonding. We do flip chip, and whatever way that we can uh, get all this. Uh, Three five good stuff onto silicon. So this is uh, the metamorphic growth that in the old days everything we want let us match that will give you the best crystal and give you the best device performance. And then uh, about 20 years ago, people start with this uh, pseudomorphic growth. If you have, uh, you choose a semiconductor with a lattice, different lattice constant, and you still want it in on some substrates that is available, that's a good quality. And if you limit your layer thickness, then you can keep them pseudomorphic. You either under um, compressive string, like get them indium arsenide, on get them arsenide, or tensile string, you put phosphorus in there. And then, the, then this uh, will be the tensile string, and um, tensile string and this compressive string. And then they will be still be sort of lattice match on the in plane, but uh, distorted on the other in the in the vertical direction. But you have uh, one good thing going on is that the string engineering, and then the, the silicon people are like learning from us doing this uh, with the silicon germanium and also the nitride put in the string to enhance the mobility of the transistor. But we did that way back at the gallium indium arsenide um, in the 80s and doing the pseudomorphic. And now the pseudomorphic uh, lasers and um, pseudomorphic transistors, they are great devices and they're commercial. And then there's a metamorphic growth is uh, your grown layers after a certain thickness, it relaxes to its original lattice constant. So this is supposed to be bad because the lattice uh, uh, quality, the crystal quality, is uh, after um, at this interface, it will be all kinds of dislocations, and uh, and you won't be able to do anything with it. And that was the traditional thinking. Uh, not until what well, this is, uh, you're all familiar with this uh, diagram now, you can see the, um, the lattice uh, matching, like because the available good substrates only come in gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, and gallium antimonide, some of them you can buy it, but the quality are very poor, and it's not good for epi. So these are the like good, I would call practical, good substrates for growing api, get more sign in the phosphide. And silicon, of course. Now this is, uh, I would say, is the most uh, successful example of metamorphic growth. Because uh, gallium nitride, you know, there's no substrate, no gallium nitride substrate. Uh, it's, people have been trying to get that for a long time, but it's still, it's, um, you start with something. Um, either sapphire or something else, or zinc oxide and whatnot. So, but people grow on sapphire, starting with the Japanese uh, back into actually starting RC lab way back. But it was the, the Japanese group that really got it working since 1993. It's this uh, in-gen and gen LED uh, multi-layer quantum well on sapphire. That is 13% lattice mismatch. And then the dislocation density that they're seeing in this is in the order at the beginning, it's order of 10 to the 10th per centimeter square. 
it's outrageous. But then it's giving you light. And then now it's uh, improving. I mean, well, this looks like a layer cake, but it's not a piece of cake. And uh, you've got to work hard on it, but you, you work hard on it. And now they're talking about the solid state lighting. It's really going to replace the light, and it will give you watts of, of power. And the cost is also coming down. And, but this was nobody believed in this um, just maybe 10 years ago that we can really can do solid state lighting. And it all began here in UIUC, Professor Nate Honingyang, this LED thing. So this is in, in our laboratories that uh, we started with the Astron 2000 HT system with the um, six nitride um, growth on sapphire or silicon or silicon carbide, and uh, but it's a limited two inch wafer size. And this is a, what we got about nine years ago when I first went there to Hong Kong. And then later on, a couple years later, and then we got this uh, Astron 200 slash 4 system. I think you have the same thing here uh, for arsenic phosphorus antimony alloy growth. And so this, uh, this uh, are the two um, reactors we have uh, growing all these uh, layers uh, for all the results I'm talking here. And uh, last year we got um, another one of this uh, was donated by industry because they have increased their production scale to 35, 49 wafers and this is six wafer systems to them. It's not cost effective. So they donate a system to us and we're trying to get it up and running. And now let's uh, talk about the motivation I talked about earlier. Now we are trying to get everything on the silicon substrate. Um, today my focus of the seminar is uh, direct growth because I've been doing MOCVD for the past, um, I don't want to say how many years, 25 <laughs> or more. And I have the joke uh, with Jim, I said I started when I was eight. <laughs> So this is, uh, uh, we, uh, first uh, we started with uh, uh, three nitride, and then uh, later on, um, we also do this uh, get arsenide in the phosphide and alloys, and we are growing on the silicon. And why? Because the silicon is uh, come in good quality and large size, 12 inch, and low cost, it's uh, not just the cost of the wafer itself, actually 12 inch silicon is not cheap. But you compare with a four inch or three inch uh, silicon and get more slide in the phosphorus, silicon is still much cheaper. And it's uh, commercially available. And uh, the main thing is the lower manufacturing cost. Because in principle, you cost a wafer 12 inch and the cost of wafer of uh, three inch or two inch. The processing cost, or manufacturing cost, is essentially the same. But you get a lot more and thousands and thousands more from a 12 inch wafer compared with a, uh, a 2 inch or 3 inch wafer. So when you get this into manufacturing, a large wafer, and that's how the silicon industry is so cost effective because they work with the large wafers. And if we can get the 3.5 on the silicon and it will be a very, very cost effective way. Uh, also, well, the even in our laboratory now, now I spend a lot less money buying silicon wafers than buying indium phosphide wafers. And then the students, they don't like to work with indium phosphide wafers because they said you walk by them, you breathe on them, they'll just break. And in silicon wafers, you can throw them as a substrate, they don't break. And so it's a, a much easier to work with. And then the second technology is the most advanced, most mature, and the most cost effective. Uh, that's why we want to uh, increase the functionalities of the silicon as, uh, by putting this uh, 3 5 and uh, 3 nitride or whatnot on uh, a silicon substrate. And then uh, we can um, integrate it with the silicon logics. Of course, the silicon IC can do best a memory or even solar cells. And the lighting part, it will be the drive circuits and the control. Now you can do this uh, LED lighting, uh, the dimming and the color mixing and all those are on the silicon. 
Well, first I'm going to talk about this uh, three nitride LEDs and the uh, three nitride handset that we glue on uh, 111 silicon. And these are the big challenges. Okay, this uh, 16 percent less mismatch, and it will generate a lot of uh, dislocation, the high dislocation density. And then because of the thermal expansion coefficient is 54 percent different, and it will generate a lot of cracks. Once you grow a couple microns, it cracks all over the place. So when you try to um, grow this on the silicon, particularly for nitride, is that the growth temperature is at 1,100 degrees. The ram up and ram down, even though when it's growing, it doesn't crack. When you ram it down to cool it down, and then you can hear the crack. We heard <laughs> It's depressing. So we find different ways of trying to mitigate these problems, and one of the ways is that to put in an in situ silicon nitride mass layer. So that's um, like you know that growing on um, the metamorphic growth, you need a low temperature nucleation layer. That's what everybody does. It's a low temperature aluminum nitride, gallium nitride on the sapphire substrate. And after that, then we grow a silicon nitride. We deposit a very thin layer of silicon nitride. And the purpose of this is to enhance the lateral growth. The silicon nitride is not completely covering the whole surface. It just is sporadically cover, but you don't, like, people would do this with the gallium nitride, the blue lasers, with photolithography, putting the stripes on there to enhance the lateral growth. But for us, instead of doing the lithography, we do this in situ silicon nitride deposition but it served the same purpose, and we find that it worked. And this is to enhance the lateral growth. And we are, were able to um, reduce if we have maximum of the SLD from uh, without the silicon nitride layer in the 002 direction and 102 direction significantly. And uh, this was a few years ago. So this is one of the tricks that we have been uh, well established and still using. And another one is uh, have this uh, strain balancing interlayer, aluminum nitride, and the low temperature aluminum nitride, aluminum gallium nitride is uh, for strain balancing. And then another way we deal with the crab problem is we pattern the silicon before we grow on them. And I call it either cheating or the, <laughs> the a shortcut to do that because uh, once you grow the gallium nitride and silicon, and uh, it will after a while uh, that it will because of the strain they begin, this layer begin to crack. So we pattern the silicon so that they are not growing on the whole wafer, but on this small islands. I mean, they're go we're going to pattern them anyway uh, to make the LEDs. So we pattern them first. So what they're growing will be just on the islands, and they'll be less likely to crack, and the strain will be relieved. And also, as when you scale up to, say, really, when you scale up to 12 inch, and you're not really scaling up trying to grow on the 12 inch wafer, then it will be harder and harder. So now we pattern it first. It will be the same, you know, grow on 2 inch, 3 inch, 4 inch, because you're still growing on these small islands, and you don't have to worry about the wafer bowing or cracking. And we find it works pretty well, and we make the LEDs out of it. Of course, later on, we perfect our growth um, skills. We don't. Uh, we still can get crack free without patterning. But this is one of our early work. It still work now. Um, uh, when we are we add to was adding up, and then we find cracks on our growth. And then hey, let's try a pattern wafer, and then they they will be crack free. So this is an SEM image that we uh, uh, pattern our silicon wafer with different size islands. And then with this street, 20 micron street between them, and then we etch it down to a 3 micron deep. And then on top of this, we can grow the 2 micron craft free gallium nitride, and then we uh, put LEDs on top of them. And this is uh, another uh, picture. So this is a cross section. So we etch the silicon a like, uh, um, few micron deep, and then what is grown outside of the, um, the platform of the plateau. And you can see it, the crack. And then on top, this is a, what is grow on top. It's a nice and smooth. It has this uh, facet at the corner. 
And this is the AFM uh, image that we uh, get this uh, over two microns, three nitride. And uh, we get the RMS is uh, about 1.3 nanometer. And this optical microscope, you see this um, uh, sort of the texture. Uh, so you always see this, uh, but, um, but you don't see any crack. And then we just uh, fabricate the standard LED by etching down to the end layer of the gallium nitride. So this is the layer cake that, um, that we glue and then etch down to make your end contacts. And then there's a current spreading layers for the P contact. And then there's the, the P electro. So the, all the fabrication are kind of standard. There's a silicon substrate. So there's a aluminum nitride. Um, nucleation layer or seed layer, and this uh, second nitride, the in situ mass I was talking about, and then this is the N gallium nitride, and this is the inter layer for strain balancing. Then we grow another N layer for the um, electro, and then the quantum well, and then the P, um, the P side, the P electro. So um, this is some of the reason work that we did. We did this uh, LED on silicon um, like, um, three, four years ago. Now we, are, it's, of course, uh, they don't work as well as those on sapphire. I mean, you can imagine with this a uh, huge uh, um, mismatch at this location density. So we still like finding ways of the improving the performance. And uh, one is um, we do it by modulation of ammonia flow. And this uh, will improve, uh, further enhance the lateral growth and, and decrease the dislocation density. Another way is uh, we have the LED grown on the porous silicon. Then I'll tell you a little bit about how we make this a porous silicon. And then another thing, because the silicon is uh, light absorbing, and so you have the light that's emit from the LED will be absorbed by the substrate. So we have to remove the substrate and have the, um, the quantum wells transfer to other transparent substrate um, or have a mirror on the substrate. And we can get the other half that's emitting downward. So these are the um, three tricks that we have been doing recently. So with the modulation flow, the, like this is the in situ second nitride mass that we were able to improve the full half maximum of um, the GAN significantly, and then with this uh, modulation flow, then we can uh, decrease the full half maximum further, uh, what that's um, a little bit for the 002 direction, but uh, more significant for the 102 direction. So this is um, the GAN on um, silicon with this uh, full half maximum, this uh, are pretty good number. Of course, if we grow on sapphire, you get this uh, down to maybe 150 arc second. And uh, silicon is uh, much harder. And then we also like do the TM, and you can find this uh, dislocation lines. They are more likely to uh, bend sideways, and then the PL is, uh, is give you a better PL, a uh, more um, higher intensity. And then this is the second trick that I was talking about is um, to have this uh, nitride LED to grow on porous silicon. And how do we make this a porous silicon? Is uh, we like thorolithography or nano imprinting is uh, uh, like too expensive. So again, we have this uh, inexpensive way of uh, creating this uh, porous silicon. As on the silicon 111, we uh, deposit um, this oxide layer, and then the titanium is uh, essentially a glue layer. And then uh, we uh, sputter 3,500 uh, of aluminum on this uh, titanium layer. And then we put it in the, the um, phosphoric acid, and then you will create this uh, porous anodized aluminum. And this, uh, we call it AAO, anodized aluminum oxide, with these holes. And then you can control the amount of time and uh, and uh, the mole fraction of your uh, phosphoric acid. You can control the support size and the spacing. Of course, they are not as regular as this uh, uh, by photolithography or nano imprint. But the size is a you get a pretty uh, um, regular pattern, but not exactly the same shape or um, or regular um, distance between them. And then we use this as a mask 
to your edge it down, we put in an ICP etching and then uh, for the silicon, the deep uh, silicon ICP etching and then we can transfer this uh, AO anodized aluminum pattern onto the silicon and then we just uh, put it in BOE and then we move everything so we end up with this uh, uh, porous silicon that we can grow our LED on top of that, this uh, cross section of the porous silicon. And then with this uh, porous silicon, we compare with um, what we call this uh, LED on the micron scale pattern, those uh, like, uh, square one that we were talking about. We have another mass that you will see this, uh, this location lines. There are more on this uh, micro pattern and then there are the density is uh, less on this uh, porous silicon, the LED on the porous silicon. These are the LED quantum wells on top of it. And then we do uh, at this uh, interface in the silicon and the uh, gallium nitride interface, this is a aluminum nitride layer, this is uh, um, the alkane interlayer and you can see this, this location lines, they, um, they tend to bend sideways or terminate. So these are, the, we uh, find this uh, porous silicon is uh, working better than um, this, uh, what we call the micro patent. Can I, sorry, can I ask yes. a question about the, the so yes. How small do these portions to be in the one case share they're trying to Okay, it's around 100 to 120 nanometer. So if you see the scale here. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah. So each of them is around 100, 120 nanometer, the average size. So if it's a bigger than that, it wouldn't work? Uh, we, we did not try a very wide range of uh, pattern sizes, we just try a few. Um, and then the, this uh, one that we find is working fine. So we, um, then we are not, well the student want to graduate, so <laughs> she didn't <laughs> keep on the, like trying. But you can control the size by uh, the, um, how long you keep it in the phosphoric acid and the temperature and the mold fraction. And then this is uh, the LED on the porous silicon, and we compare that with the micro Raman, and then this is uh, with the standalone gallium nitride, it should be around like 567 um, inverse centimeter, and then we find that um, the micro pattern, there's a dotted line here, and uh, the nano pattern, it's a, this a solid line, the nano pattern on the porous silicon one, it is a closer to the standalone gallium nitride. That means that, that uh, the string leaf is uh, better for, um, for the LED that grown on the porous silicon. Uh, also in terms of the electrical property of the LED, uh, the reverse uh, uh, leakage is better and the forward is uh, a little bit better. Uh, this is uh, um, just uh, optical microscope of the LED growth on the porous silicon. Again, you can see it's a nice and smooth. You always see this uh, kind of um, uh, texture with the optical microscope. And then uh, um, you can also see the output power improvement with the nano pattern silicon compared with the micro pattern silicon. Do we do any kind of surface tessellation? No, no. Isn't there any concern for that? Uh, if you want to make really good, reliable LEDs, that is. But uh, here we just want to make a comparison of the different uh, uh, LED growth performance so we did not uh, do passivation on them. And then this is uh, about how we, we move the silicon substrate and then it will improve the LED performance. So we have, uh, we have to do it by uh, plating after we glue this LED and then uh, we do the copper plating and then do the transfer, the passivation, and then transfer on the copper and then we just see this um, enhancement of uh, the LED performance. But this is uh, done by dry etching of the silicon substrate. And then uh, this was done again probably four, three years ago because the student was uh, wanted to graduate and he was desperate. And uh, I, I said, well, we're supposed to do this by wet etching 
because uh, this is supposed to be a cost-effective process. If you've got to do dry etching, which is uh, too expensive, but then for the wet etching, it's a very, it turns out it's very difficult to protect the front side. And uh, we always have problem with um, the edge, the wet edges zip in, and then also attack, um, ruin the silicon, uh, the gallium nitride. So, but then he did this by dry etching and then got the LED performance enhancement and he graduated and moved on. And I have another student, I said, well, we got to do this by wet etching. <laughs> so there's another student that came in and then we developed this wet etching process. So the, the way is that we do it differently. Now we process the LED first, put in the PNN electro, and then uh, protect it with a polyimide, completely covered with polyimide. And then uh, with the wax, we mount it on a sapphire, flip it. And then now we get this um, LED protected with really well. And uh, we put it in the HMA. It's a standard LED, I mean uh, silicon edge. Then we remove the silicon around 40 minutes. The, the whole silicon substrate can be removed. And then we expose this um, gallium nitride LED. Now it's the end side up. And then we um, evaporate this uh, aluminum mirror on it because we want uh, the mirror to reflect the light, the half of the light that's emitted by the quantum well that we lost. So we put this aluminum mirror on it. And then there's a tight goal, it's a um, seat layer for copper electrode plating. So with this uh, seat layer, we can uh, play copper by electrode plating. We can play pretty thick copper because now we want to use the copper as a substrate after we remove the silicon. Now we flip it back and now copper is a substrate. Then we have the mirror, the normal mirror, the red one here to reflect the light out. And the copper is a very good heat conducting material so we can get the heat of the LED out efficiently. Questions. Yes. I have actually two questions. How do you remove the uh, polyimide? Uh, how do we remove the polyimide? Uh, the soften. I'm sorry? Soften. soften. We put it in soften. And yeah. Then do you have to worry about the uh, thermal mismatch between the copper and the gallium nitride? Uh, there is some, and uh, you have to, uh, because uh, some of this uh, we actually see. Um, the LED not perfectly flat, <laughs> but copper is relatively soft, so that's uh, easy to handle. I mean, it's um, yeah, we it's not perfectly flat. There is uh, some mismatch, but it's uh, it's uh, still um, manageable. You can press it flat, and then we get this uh, enhancement of uh, the LED performance with the uh, um, we compare before the silicon substrate removal, after the silicon substrate removal on copper, and uh, uh, we see this uh, EL spectrum um, increase. Well, you don't see much of the move of the peak. That means uh, uh, there's not a whole lot of stress. If there is, there will be a movement of the, um, the EL peak. And this is uh, the output power performance is almost a 70% improvement. It's because of the mirror we reflect uh, the light that we used to lose and now outwork. Okay, so this is uh, the LED on silicon that we did. The next one, uh, well, let's summarize first. So what we find that growing this LED on silicon, the growth window is a much smaller compared with the sapphire on silicon carbide. I don't know, maybe uh, we're, like, you are got good in the silicon carbide when you do something like on silicon and we find that if the reactor drift a little bit and then we'll lose it and then you got to tune it back and so on. And then the stream management technique is um, that we put in there or this in the layer and they tend to compromise the crystalline quality. So the two are fighting that we put in uh, actually, we try to put in multiple the strand balancing layer to grow thicker gallium nitride, but then we find that the crystalline quality get worse. So you have to find a good compromise of the two. And then um, this last one is uh, to find the effective means of removing the silicon. This is one that we um, we got a pretty good handle on. 
and it is um, the optimization of uh, to further minimize the the dislocation density. This is the tricky part. Okay, so the next one is I want to talk a little bit about like this uh, hemp that we also grew on silicon. Um, so we now we know how to grow. Um, LED on silicon, actually this is easier because this is a thinner. Uh, we use the same trick, I mean that's a, the requirement is um, like craft free, again particle free for the transistor and then the high resistivity buffer and this is one thing is different from the LED the, uh, we want the transistor that like, would not uh, leak in the buffer layer and also reasonably good mobility and she carry density for the transistor on top here and then uh, we want to have a nice and smooth uh, surface morphology with, so we can make some micron gated devices so we start off with this uh, high resistivity silicon substrate and then the same aluminum nitride nucleation and um, silicon nitride in situ mass and 0.8 micron on dopegatum nitride, we put this in the layer and then this is um, the one layer that we use at magnesium doping that to try to improve our transistor performance. So this is um, the student who just graduated this, the two things, special things that he did is uh, do this magnesium doping with the, uh, but you cannot dope the whole layer with magnesium, it's only um, 125 nanometer and also we try to keep it away from the channel because this is the two depth up here, 2 dg. Uh, also another thing is that we insert this a really thin aluminum nitride uh, spacer layer that enhance the transistor performance significantly and then the rest of it, the spacer and the 30% alkane um, and cap layer, these are standard. And this is the material characteristics of this um, alkane gang hemta on silicon. We have this uh, Hall measurements, the Hall um, shear resistance around 300. The mobility is uh, 1230, it's uh, quite good, consider it's grown on silicon with this uh, um, shear carry density. And then the XL D is um, around like 600 or less, 500, 600 in the 102 direction, around 1,000. And the AFM is pretty good, smooth enough, one nanometer. And then, uh, so we got this a uh, good with uh, high resistivity buffer that we always check, like for the transistor path from path to path, and we want to make sure that's uh, not leaking through the buffer. We apply the temple through it. It's um, like the, the current. This is the micro M, and the best we get is a uh, 10 to minus five. It's uh, really insulating. And then this is our DC transistor performance. Uh, we got the IDSS is uh, around 1100 milliamp per millimeter. And you can see the R on is pretty good because uh, our um, the mobility and everything was pretty good. And this is a one micron gate and a one micron uh, gate source spacing, one micron gate drain spacing. And the gate width is uh, 10 micron. Uh, this uh, peak transconductance around 300. And then the, um, it's a depletion mode device about um, minus uh, 2.0. And then this uh, transistor, we also check the breakdown. The student, they don't want to check the breakdown because it's a uh, wound device. <laughs> it's, uh, it's gone. But I uh, insist, you gotta check the breakdown because um, this, we want to make sure this is on silicon. They are like, at least close to what people do on sapphire on, or silicon carbide because of what we're trying to do here is a power device, it's for power switching uh, not as much as uh, the high frequency again this is a one micron device that we did and we get the uh, breakdown of the over uh, 100 volt and this off state breakdown and when we uh, like bias the gate to minus 5 volt as, um, the breakdown is uh, 104 volt and uh, for this uh, device and this the um, gate leakage that we see and uh, this we measure minus 35 and minus 14 uh, so this is um, also pretty good as uh, 0.12 um, microamp per millimeter and at minus 35 volt is a little higher 
And then we also check the, the RF performance. And this is the one with the one micron gate length. And then uh, on some of the, the um, we have the 0.7 micron gate length on our mass, but it does not turn out every time because we do this by uh, optical lithography. Uh, so this is a one micron gate length. We get the FT of uh, 8 gigahertz and F max of 14.5. But then for this uh, um, 0.7 micron one, we can get uh, at mass up to 37 uh, gigahertz. And this is uh, pretty good for the one micron gate length on silicon. OK, so this is uh, what we have for um, the power transistors on silicon. And this is um, getting a lot of attention recently because it's uh, power switching. Uh, it's um, the traditional silicon circuit, the LD MOS, and those, uh, they cannot switch over like a few hundred volts. And now people are trying to um, do this for commercial switching, not for military applications. So they want to be on silicon. So this uh, um, is a lot of people are like, um, trying to get this uh, GAN device on silicon for commercial applications. Okay, so this is the next topic that I want to uh, talk about. This um, aluminum medium arsenide, gallium medium arsenide, mHem to on a silicon 100. Now we have to grow on the 100, not 111, because the 111 is for nitride, it's the, the 111 cut is the closer to hexagonal. Now we have to do this on 100, for this uh, three five and silicon marriage that we are trying to uh, promote. So this is started um, by Intel a few years ago. That uh, actually they started in the early two thousands. They start with this uh, indium and termini transistors that they made um, in the IEDM two thousand and four. They compare the uh, point two micron, the same geometry. Uh, indium and termini and the 0.2 micron MOS, uh, they found that that this is three five is a three times faster compared with the speed and compared with the power consumption, it's a ten times a lower power consumption. So I guess uh, like Dr. Robert Chow was here last year. You heard a lot about this. Uh, why they are doing this? And they think it's 3.5 in 2015 is a transistor option. So we have uh, still have um, five years uh, to prove it. <laughs> and then uh, what, is it the, what they think is the integration with silicon is the key. So that we must do this on silicon as the integration. Uh, that, that's the key. And so this is uh, what um, one of the executives that talk about to the semiconductor. Um, Industry Association 2007, they actually they put this on the ITRIS roadmap. So now um, that in addition to this uh, 35 on silicon, there's also a lot of work on the 35 MOS, the MOS. Uh, another, another program that we're trying to do is to get the P channel. That's the really challenging one because they always want CMOS. And then 3.5, yes, that's great with the N channel, but there's no 3.5. It has this um, inherent uh, low hole mobility for 3.5. So, but then uh, we'll be able to find something that's just better than silicon. Now, back to this uh, chart again. Again, that we uh, work with 3.5, and then we have we can do all this uh, band structure engineering. We can do this um, channel with the strain management. And then we can do this hacktail structure to increase uh, mobility and the two depth and the current density and so on. So we have a wide range of um, uh, three, five to choose to find our best uh, transistor material. Uh, so in the Mentemana, yeah, I got high mobility, but it's, it's, uh, the band gap is too small. It's extremely leaky. So um, uh, we uh, want to stick with this uh, lattice match or indium phosphide transistors that we have proved that it's working the best, the in-gas channel transistor, uh, particularly with a little bit of strain, the high indium composition with the compressive strain, the grown on indium phosphide is the best transistor ever, the highest, uh, highest speed performance. Now the challenge is how do we put it on silicon? And you can see 
that for Kedemoss night, this is a 4% mismatch. Now we want this lattice match to indium phosphide. It's another 4%. And so at the beginning, we try to grow directly of the indium phosphide on silicon. It's very difficult. So we kind of gave up in a, a few months uh, because uh, we developed the technology to how to grow metamorphic devices, which are let us match the indium phosphide on gilded morsonite. We got very good device result. So now I said, we just have to figure out how to grow good gilded morsonite on silicon. Then we just snap the two together. Uh, will be set. Okay, again, these are the growth challenges for this 3.5 on silicon. So the last mismatch, 8% that we were talking about. And then the thermal mismatch, it's not as bad as the gallium nitride, but it's still, it's a thermal mismatch. And this anti phase domain thing, because the silicon is non polar, 3.5 is polar. Uh, so these are our problems we need to solve, but we can learn from uh, what we learn from gallium nitride. And a lot of this are not as bad. And now when I do this, a lot of people ask me, hey, we done this way back in the 80s uh, on this 3.5 uh, on silicon work. Well, you're now doing different. I said, yeah, it's a very different because of back in the 80s that most of the words of the gallium arsenide or indium phosphide and whatnot on silicon, they're focused on optoelectronic electronic applications. And they're trying to grow lasers. And lasers, they are very high current density, <coughs> minority carrier devices. So even though you get them to lace, they only lace for a few seconds or split seconds. And they don't last. And they're very, very sensitive to this, this locations. And we can minimize this location. We cannot completely eliminate them. No way. So it's a, a very difficult to get the laser to really work with library with this relatively high current density. What we're doing now, we're doing this a low power device for logic, majority carrier device, the transport is horizontal. So I always tell people that I picked the easy problem to work on. <laughs> it's, the laser is too hard for me. Uh, and then uh, we work on this uh, for logic applications, the low power, we don't have to worry about the, the um, the high uh, current, and then uh, we have this uh, new improved growth technology that we didn't have in the 80s. We have in situ monitoring that we didn't have. Well, I'm talking about MOCVD, MBE people had that. Uh, we didn't have that. And also another thing is so uh, we learn from the gallium nitride people, and uh, what the tricks I'm using now is practically move it from gallium nitride and they also work for this uh, order 3.5. And we didn't know that back in the 80s. Now, why MOCVD? Because it's compatible with the silicon process. You know, the silicon people, they always do CVD. They have tons of CVD systems. They do MOCVD um, for all these uh, materials in the silicon fab. And then also MOCVD is some um, has proven to be as a for high volume production, this solid state lighting I was talking about, that people are growing like 49 wafers, 11 wafers in, a, in a one chamber. And then the HBTs, there's six, six inch gallium arsenide wafers for manufacturing. So this are proven cost effective and reliable enough for production. So the, this is what's good about the MOCVD. And the MOCVD is also relatively, it has a higher uptime. And this is uh, what uh, MO stands for. It's uh, mostly operational. For those of you who know what MBE stands for. No? Mostly broken equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's another one. <laughs> but this is uh, for the mostly broken equipment. <laughs> This is it's a mostly operational. So we have the background technology that um, in our group that we have grown this uh, metamorphic hemp and metamorphic HBT. Uh, these are let us match the indium phosphide on gallium arsenide substrates. And these are one micron hemp that we uh, get this FT and F max to be uh, at um, like 71 gigahertz. And we published this a couple years ago. Uh, recently, we make a submicron 150 nanometer um, 
gated device, uh, we can get it up to like 270 gigahertz for the app max. Uh, this is um, uh, the metamorphic uh, HBTs. In fact, I gave some material to um, one of uh, Professor Milton Fan's students, uh, and he also got some pretty good results. And this uh, was done at, um, by Professor Bernanese at the Simon Fraser University, because uh, we are not very good in uh, fabricating the HBTs. Um, so these are, are the, the FT is uh, 90 gigahertz, and F max is uh, 100 gigahertz. So we have a, a very good uh, growth um, handle on this metamorphic growth. And now, in uh, 2007, that um, Intel that we put this uh, metamorphic hint on silicon by MBE, uh, they have this uh, 2 micron gated marsonite, and this uh, 1.2 micron IAA indium aluminum marsonite, and then this uh, in gas quantum well. Well, by 2007, they already switched from the indium antimonide to the in gas. And then they found that um, the cutoff frequency performance comparing with the MMOS, because they always use the MMOS as a benchmarking, is a, a very good. So um, uh, we, at that time, the Intel started the program with us, so we are also working on this, but we do it by the MOCVD. And this is our layer structure. And the transistor structure is essentially the same as the metamorphic transistor structure. And what we need to work out is uh, we have this uh, indium phosphide that's match to get a marsonite, and we need to have this uh, get a marsonite on silicon. We need to have this work out, and also this uh, two buffer layer here is for the electrical isolation. We want we don't want the transistor to be leaky through the buffer. We because at the beginning we have a hard time pinching off them. So we spend a lot of time develop these uh, buffer here so that these devices can be pinched off nicely. Um, so there are uh, many of the concerns about um, the transistor performance. So one of the uh, major concerns is, um, is the buffer leakage. And then we have this uh, um, composite buffer that we call here, the total thickness about 1.5 micron. Uh, we, this are our growth conditions. We did it in our 200 system. Uh, we use a 100 silicon wafer, no special cut, no miscut, because uh, the, the silicon people, they don't like to work with miscut wafers. So we try to just get the silicon wafer from our fab, and uh, we just grow on it. I said, well, let's try this first. If it doesn't work, then we buy this miscut wafers. I don't know if any of you have buy miscut wafers. The problem is not only expensive, you've got to buy a whole brew. And then they specially make for you, make the special cut for you, and you've got to buy hundreds and hundreds of wafers. And you don't know whether they work or not, and then you don't know what to do with them. So we said, well, we just work with whatever we get from the clean room. And then this is our standard ammo sources we use and the silicon doping, and then the low temperature layer that we grew, like I said earlier, we use the gallium nitride trick, as so like when we go from the silicon to gallium arsenide, we do this low temperature gallium arsenide location layer, and then the high temperature gallium arsenide, the routine temperature, and then we do this low temperature indium phosphide, the nucleation on gallium arsenide, the metamorphic growth, and then this high temperature. We don't use germanium, we don't use super lattice, we don't use compositional grading. So all those three are the traditional um, metamorphic growth techniques that people use on silicon. Because the germanium is almost as lattice match to get a marsonite. And, uh, and then everybody thought that, well, you use the germanium as a buffer. I said, no, germane is too expensive. I cannot afford germane, buying germane. Uh, so uh, we find this uh, working pretty well. <coughs> and then uh, one of the tricks is so we have to do the 850 degrees C thermal annealing, the cleaning before the growth, and also it will help create this uh, sort of um, um, the step on the surface that would minimize the anti-phase domains. So this is the in-situ monitoring that I was talking about. I have, uh, we have this apiras that we can get this uh, signature of this metamorphic growth. 
So this, uh, the low temperature gate arsenide layer, high temperature gate arsenide layers, the low temperature indium phosphide, the high temperature indium phosphide, and then there's uh, IAA layers, low temperature, high temperature, and then there's uh, the transistor layers on top. So we can monitor this uh, growth when uh, something goes on, goes wrong, then we know about it, then we can abort the run. And this is the result of the 2DG, <coughs> and we have this uh, template that we glue the indium phosphide and get more on silicon. And this is a uh, um, the nice and step flow pattern. We got the 0.6 nanometer uh, surface of this template when we have the whole transistor structure on it, and then uh, it get quite a bit rougher. And it's um, but it's not bad. It's three nanometer across as um, uh, five micron square. And then we measure the hall mobility. It's the room temperature is uh, 4,500 and the liquid nitrogen about 14,000. And if we have this, uh, we did the pseudomorphic growth, and this, the best we get is around 38,000 in um, on liquid nitrogen. And um, if we do it on indium phosphide, it's actually not that much better, a little bit better. And this is the TEM of the showing this uh, silicon, and then this the uh, gate arsenide, this the uh, indium phosphide, you can see the low temperature interface is a uh, more dislocation, and then this is the IAA, low temperature, the high temperature, and then this the uh, metamorphic heme structure that we have blown up here, and you can see that the crystal quality and the interface is uh, pretty good. <coughs> I guess my time is up. And then this uh, SLD, you see the silicon, the gamosinide of the temperate and the indium phosphide. And then this is uh, with the MHEM structure. And then those are IAA that is not perfectly lattice matched the indium phosphide. It doesn't matter. So I'm just showing here for this particular run, we got the best device result. And these uh, two layers are not perfectly lattice matched. Some of them are, they intend to be lattice uh, matched the indium phosphide but it does not matter, it's uh, for the electrical isolation purpose. And this is the standard fabrication process. We do the standard drain source and then the ohmic content was pretty good. And we did the mesa isolation and the citric acid for the gate recess. And then we made the one micron gated device. And this is our um, DC characteristics. On silicon, the IDSS, we got it's a 720 milliamp per millimeter. And there's a one micron device. And the, um, the maximum GM that we get is around 600, um, over 600 millisiemen per millimeter. And it's uh, pinched off nicely. So there's a pretty good DC result. And we measure the RF for the one micron. We got the 39 FT and the 50 F max. It's actually now we get a little bit better, around 57, 60. And we're trying to make a smaller gate device. This is a one micron gate to see it's, um, we have a difficulty because uh, these, the surface morphology are not that perfectly good. It's a thicker pimples, so. To conclude that uh, we were able to grow this metamorphic hem on silicon 100, and uh, we were the first one that we poured this uh, device result, the RF, DC, and RF. And then that's the best mobility we got. And um, again, the device performance is, does not like, always um, increase linearly with the DC, the hall mobility. And uh, so for this uh, best RF, and uh, the mobility is around uh, 13,000. And then now we're still working on this. And now we need to further reduce the dislocation density. And uh, we increase the indium content for the channel to get the high mobility. Uh, we also start growing on P-type silicon, and, um, and then the device passivation to improve the gate leakage. And also, uh, we are making some micron devices. Now, this is uh, my favorite slide. It's the, the practical issues of a growing API for devices. The consistent of the growth systems. For those of you, your growers, you know your system will behave today. Next week, it might not. Next month, uh, get to pet it a little bit and uh, to get it to work. And sometimes it takes a long time to uh, to get the consistency. 
And then the hardest part is the correlation optimization of this, um, all this M by M matrices. Uh, what are these M by M matrices? Okay, you have this uh, device structure, this multi-layer thickness of each of the layer, the composition, and the doping concentration. Okay, you have this nice device design. I suppose according to the model, the modelers they said it's supposed to give you all these device characteristics. The, the current density, the, the FT, F mass, and whatnot, and the performance. And then when you actually try to grow this layer, so what you're really getting, and sometimes you don't really know, uh, particularly the HBTs, and you can only characterize them, some of the parameters. Then uh, what is this uh, M layers and N layers, the different um, compositions, thicknesses, doping concentration, and how much off are them? Are they, and then um, how does it like, translate it to your device performance? So that's another M by N matrix that is sort of unknown. And then your growth parameters, that these are supposed to be controllable, the temperature pressure and all your mole ratios and all those, and supposed to give you a certain um, material characteristics. You characterize them with the SLD, AFM, and Hall, and the problem is that uh, when you try to optimize one thing and the other thing might go, like I try to tune the temperature to minimize, uh, to improve the surface, and, uh, and then the, the whole mobility might go. You never know. So you're always uh, trying to work with this another M growth parameters and N characteristics of your materials. And then how do these material characteristics translate to your device characteristics? You optimize it for the frequency, you optimize it for power, you optimize for whatnot, and what, like, what do you tweak to do that? So, and then of course, there's the process parameters, or all this contact resistances, the gate recess, all this uh, will affect your device performance. So, it takes a lot of a shell at homes to investigate and solve all these cases. And so I'm telling people that uh, we train a lot of Sherlock Holmes in our lab, and I tell them don't get frustrated. I mean, Sherlock Holmes doesn't solve all the cases, and you just solve some, you're in good shape. So these are my Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> and uh, th th some of them are graduated, some are still with us. So our work is uh, supported by Intel and then the funding agencies in Hong Kong, the uh, Research Grants Council and the um, Inno Innovative Technology Commission. And we also get a lot of support from Astra and uh, Roman Haas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're actually running five minutes over. So if anybody has any questions, I would ask them to just um, speak with our speaker after. Um, there's pizza outside. Um, go home.